Chapter 59 Service as Power Leviticus 23, 22 And when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest, neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 23, 22 We have, as in Leviticus 19, 9 and 10, a reference to gleaning, and the law is restated in Deuteronomy 24, 19 and 22. The law is repeated to stress the concern that God requires us to show for the poor, for widows and orphans, and for aliens. In Ruth 2, we have an example of the application of this law. Man's harvest or pay time must be a time of active help for the needy. In Leviticus, this is associated with Pentecost. In Acts 2, 1-4, we see God's gift of the Spirit to the apostles, so that at Pentecost God gave, so that man might give in turn. The fact that gleaning is cited together with the Feast of Pentecost tells us that ritual and worship must have results in charity and action. The worship God requires is not a separation from life, but unto God, and in him, action in the world, in obedience to God our King. In a sense, the culmination of the harvest festivals is the joyful fact that we have a harvest which will prosper God's kingdom, ourselves, and the needy, because God has blessed us, we are to bless others. Calvin has wisely noted, God here inculcates liberality upon the possessors of the land when their fruits are gathered, for when his bounty is exercised before our eyes, it invites us to imitate him, and it is a sign of ingratitude, unkindly and maliciously to withhold what we derive from his blessing. God does not indeed require that those who have abundance should so profusely give away their produce as to despoil themselves by enriching others, and, in fact, Paul prescribes this as the measure of our alms, that their relief should not bring into distress the rich themselves who kindly distribute. 2 Corinthians 8.13 God, therefore, permits everyone to reap his corn, to gather his vintage, and to enjoy his abundance, provided the rich, content with their own vintage and harvest, do not grudge the poor the gleaning of the grapes and corn, not that he absolutely assigns to the poor whatever remains, so that they may seize it as their own, but that some small portion may flow gratuitously to them from the munificence of the rich. He mentions, indeed, by name the orphans and widows and strangers, yet undoubtedly he designates all to the poor and needy who have no fields of their own to sow or reap, for it will sometimes occur that... Orphans are by no means in want, but rather that they have the means of being liberal themselves, nor are widows and strangers always hungry. Calvin's summary calls attention to certain key facts of this law. First, it is God who requires charity of us. It is a law, not an option. Second, the law of gleaning gives no title to the poor for our goods or wealth. It is not their right. It is rather God's mercy expressed through his people. Thus, the law of gleaning denies an option to the rich or a right to the poor. Third, its purpose is community and charity is the means of establishing it. The goal is a covenantal tie between men. This is summed up in Leviticus 25, 14 to 17 and 35. Ye shall not therefore oppress one another, but thou shalt fear thy God, for I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 25.17 Instead of oppression, there must be help. Failure to help means a violation of the communion with God as well as man. Gill noted, Even Ezra observes, the Feast of Weeks being the feast of the firstfruits of the wheat harvest, 
It is repeated here that they might not forget what God has commanded them to do at that time, namely to leave somewhat for the poor, and the Jewish writers observe that this law, being put among the solemn feasts of the Passover, Pentecost and Tabernacles, and the beginning of the year, and the Day of Atonement, teaches that he observes it, and leaves the corner of the field and the gleanings to the poor. It is as if he built the sanctuary and offered his sacrifices in the midst of it. But a much better reason may be given for it, which was to teach them that when they express their thankfulness to God, they should exercise charity and liberality to the poor. The laws of charity have had a long history of both remarkable observance and serious neglect, both in Judaism and in Christianity. Very early, the Church began to create institutions to govern covenantal life. In 1 Corinthians 6, 1-4, St. Paul gives the requirement for Christian courts of justice. These were quickly established, became a powerful force for centuries, and attracted even the ungodly. To provide justice is a merciful act. Various, hospitable institutions, to use Riquet's phrase, were also established by the early church. There was, first, Zenodocium, which provided lodging for passing strangers, pilgrims, refugees, exiles and others. Rich and poor were alike helped, and the hospitality was good enough to please the rich. Because the inns of the Greco-Roman world were also houses of prostitution, the girl being a part of the provision for the travellers, the Zenodocium served a very important function in providing a godly inn. Second, the Mosocomium was a hospital for the sick, and it provided doctors, stretcher-bearers and attendants, and also a priest. Third, the Orphanotrophium, or orphanage, provided food, clothing, shelter, and an education to the many orphans of that era. Fourth, there was a gerontocomium, or gerocomium, to provide care for the aged in the forms of shelter, food, clothing, and general care. Fifth, later in the medieval era, when the Crusades brought back leprosy into Europe, special hospitals were built for the care of lepers. Sixth, the ransoming of captives became a part of the Christian ministry also. St. Epiphanius, A.D. 439-497, Bishop of Pavia, ransomed more than 6,000 prisoners. These were the major forms of charitable activities in that era. These were ministries carried out by the Church or by Christians who felt called to the specific services. St. John Chrysostom made it clear, however, that giving away money to charitable causes did not dissolve our personal responsibility to be charitable as occasion required it. Perhaps someone of you says, I, if it were given me to entertain Paul as a guest, I readily and with much eagerness would do this. Lo, it is in thy power to entertain Paul's master for thy guest, and thou wilt not, for... He that receiveth one of these least, he saith, receiveth me. Matthew 18.5, Luke 9.48 By how much the brother may be least, so much the more does Christ come to thee through him. For he that receives the great often does it from vain glory also, but he that receives the small does it purely for Christ's sake. It is in thy power to entertain even the Father of Christ as thy guest, and thou wilt not, for I was a stranger, he says, and he took me in, Matthew twenty-five thirty-five, and again. And to one of the least of these, the brethren that believe on me, ye have done it unto me. Ibid 40 Though it be not Paul, yet it be a believer and a brother, although the least, Christ cometh to thee through him. It is very important in this connection to note that Scripture tells us that such charitable service is both our duty to further community 
and the only true means to dominion and authority, our Lord declares. But Jesus called him unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister, and whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. Matthew twenty twenty five to 28 Christians have forgotten how they became great, and as a result they have lost strength. Our Lord is very clear. Service is power, and it is the foundation of true authority and dominion. The modern state is aware of this in a Machiavellian sense. Hence, the state has taken over the church's diaconal service. It is now the dispenser of charity or welfare, and its power is largely based on this service. No resentment against the state's power can alter its power. Only as the church restores the ministry of service, the diaconal ministry, to its ordained intention, will it regain its freedom. To surrender the diaconate to the state leads to disaster, no less now than in ancient Rome. As Otto Scott has noted, other areas have also been taken over by the enemies of Christ. Psychiatry and psychology in the West have replaced the confessional. In Marxist countries, forced public confessions give us a more grim example of this.